Hello to all. So a warm welcome to the discussion of the microbiology multiple choice questions that were asked in the recently concluded AIMS PG entrance exam. Right, right at the outset, I would like to say that these questions are, and as well as their options, are based on the recall by the various students who have helped me out. So in case there is any discrepancy, please pardon me. So our first question is, where would the eggs or ova of helminths be concentrated by the formal ether technique shown in the figure? Right. So we have been marked out layer one, layer two, layer three and layer four. Now, formal ether technique is a sedimentation technique. Right. So in sedimentation technique, all the eggs, the oozes, the ova, etc. will all be concentrated in the lowest most layer right so the answer to this is layer four now let's quickly do a few important points about stool processing the preservatives which are commonly used for stool are formalin and this is what is most commonly used then we also can use polyvinyl alcohol we can also use the Shaudin solution. And lastly, we can also use the Marthiolate iodine formalin solution. Right, so these are the four preservatives that we can use to maintain the morphology of the ophosis, etc. Right, so next we move on to the macroscopic examination of the stool specimens. Now for macroscopic, what we can use it for is basically we can see the segments of the cestodes, right? So we can see the segments of say tinea or diphylobotrium latum. Then we can also macroscopically examine the stool specimen for the adult roundworms. Roundworms of Ascaris, of the hookworms, of Echino uh, Enterobius, and Trichinella. Right? So that's for macroscopic examination. We can look for segments of the adult roundworms. Moving on to microscopic examination. So we can use the saline mount and also the iodine mount. And finally, we have the permanent stains. Permanent stains like iron hematoxylin stains. or we can use the trichrome strain. And finally, the modified ZN or the modified Kinion stain, right? Moving on to concentration techniques regarding which we had asked, we had been asked the question. So concentration methods, which will improve the sensitivity of the microscopic methods are broadly divided into the flotation techniques and the sedimentation techniques. As we just learned, the sedimentation technique, what is the example for this? It is the formal ether method. Right. And the flotation technique, what all chemical we can use, these are basically fluids which have higher specific gravity. Like saturated salt solution or a saturated sugar solution or zinc sulfate 
or we can use sodium nitrate or we can use magnesium sulfate right so these are all fluids of higher specific gravity so in which case all the uh, the nematode eggs they will float onto the top so remember that flotation techniques are basically going to concentrate the nematodes eggs right so basically this is the picture of how do we do the flotation techniques so that's what we've done we've added the chemical left it for some time and you're going to put a slide onto the top and leave it for 20 minutes and then gently invert it and observe it under the microscope right you all must have be remembering that we study eggs which float in a saturated salt solution except these ones right so you must be remembering that we learn this eggs that do not float in a saturated salt saturated salt solution are the unfertilized eggs of ascaris the oocysts of penia solium and saginata and the eggs of the intestinal flukes like fasciolopsis busci etc right so this is regarding the flotation techniques higher specific gravity chemical fluids are used in sedimentation technique we are going to use chemical of lower specific gravity we just learned the example of the formal ether sedimentation techniques with all the protozoans so this is the advantage of using the sedimentation techniques both protozoan as well as helminth eggs oocysts cysts etc will be concentrated at the bottom of the tube our next question was an image based question so the epidemiological cycle of the organism was shown what was the likely vector for this organism mite hard tick soft tick and louse now looking at this figure that's our human host it is getting infected by a six legged larva and we have the eight legged adult and the nymph the reservoir is rodents right so whenever you see that a larva is biting the human and transmitting the infection what are you going to think of shigers shigerosis scrub typhus right and so what is the vector for scrub typhus it is the mite that's our answer another important point to register here is the trans ovarian transmission right so the eggs also get infected when the adult uh, arthropod lays the eggs right so what are we going to remember that trans ovarian transmission is seen in case of mites sandfly black fly and ticks right so for these vectors there is trans ovarian transmission so from the adult the infection is going to get transmitted also to the eggs right so that's our six legged larva of mite those are the eight legged nymph and the adult mite right now scrub typhus is a very very commonly asked disease in all our entrance exams so we got two questions on scrub typhus scrub typhus all true except so we have to find the wrong statement transmitted by shigers true lymph adenopathy is a feature yes regional lymphadenopathy is seen it is lactose fermenting on mekonki medium now a smart person will immediately pick it up that it's a rickettsial organism rickettsia are non cultivable on cell free media so it will never grow on mekonki leave aside lactose or non lactose fermenting and option d says man is an accidental host so the wrong option here is it is lactose fermenting on mac let's quickly go through the important points regarding scrub typhus scrub typhus is the commonest rickettsial disease in india very often reported from the hilly areas of india there are two species which cause this disease orientia susugamushi and there's another species orientia 
truth oh that is from uae so it is only reported from this part of the world and please remember earlier there were three zero types of orientia sushuga mishi now there are five zero types then there is a zoonotic tetrad associated with scrub typhus what is that zoonotic tetrad the orientia organism the mites rather the shigers of the mites the rodents which are the reservoirs and a characteristic vegetation which is described as scrub vegetation so that scrub vegetation is primarily found in hilly areas that's why uh, it is reported from the uttaranchal etc in the question sometimes you get a clinical question generally the patient is from uttaranchal etc right and humans are dead end hosts now scrub typhus has an incubation period of 6 to 21 days after which as we all know rickettsial diseases what is the characteristic triad the fever with the rash with vasculitis and also remember myalgias is a common feature so fever headache myalgias then a diffuse macular or a maculopapular rash may be seen plus at the site of the bite of the shigers this is the characteristic lesion which is called as eschar or takenoir associated with regional lymphadenopathy right so this was mentioned in the question lymphadenopathy some people develop severe scrub typhus and they develop the complications of meningoencephalitis respiratory failure or renal failure then multi organ failure may occur due to disseminated intravascular coagulation and in pregnancy it may lead to miscarriage for diagnosis of scrub typhus we use the wheel felix reaction in which we can detect the oxk antibodies but this is not a very reliable method so we have more specific serological tests in the form of immunofluorescence assays elisas the rapid diagnostic tests like the immunochromatographic tests and the pcr generally a combination of the molecular method with the more specific serological tests is used finally what is the drug of choice for scrub typhus always remember drug of choice for most rickettsial infections is doxycycline so doxycycline is to be given for 1 to 2 weeks alternative drug is chloramphenicol and in case it's a pregnant female we will treat by giving azithromycin right so that's regarding scrub typhus we got two questions moving on to a question that was asked in pgi june 2020 exam which of the following statements are true about scrub typhus it is caused by rickettsia rickettsia rickettsi wrong statement caused by yes orientia it is might born it is not tick born and doxycycline can be used for treatment type of diphtheria vaccine as we all know it is such an easy question diphtheria vaccine is the toxoid so answer is diphtheria toxoid right so please remember that this is prepared by using the park william strain and what is it it is formal toxoid which is then adsorbed onto aluminium phosphate so that is the adjuvant aluminium phosphate also remember that for children the dose of the diphtheria toxoid that is in the dtap vaccine the amount of diphtheria toxoid ranges from 10 to 25 flocculating units this is for children less than 7 years of age for more than 7 years of age children we use the small d and this small d is containing 
ranging from 1 to 2.5 flocculating units of the diphtheria toxoid, right? So this is the small d, this is the big d. The gene expert system detects mutation in which of the following genes? INHA, RPOB, CATG or RD1? The answer to this question is RPOB gene. The gene expert system in India is also called as the CBNAT, cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification test. The gene expert is also called as the expert MTB RIF assay, right? The cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification test I've already talked about it several times that it is a real-time PCR-based method which just requires 90 to 120 minutes for detection of two genes. One, IS6110, that is for detecting the presence of the organism, mycobacterium, tuberculosis, and it detects the gene in the, or rather a mutation in the RPOP gene. So it is detecting the rifampicin resistance. Right? It is an absolutely automated method. So we don't even need to do the processing of the sputum specimen. No Petrov's method, no uh, uh, homogenization, etc. is required. So the sample preparation, the amplification detection is totally automated. And hardly any training is required for this method. Now, I want you to be aware that there's another new assay, which is MTB RIF Ultra assay. Now, what is the purpose of introducing this is it has improved the sensitivity in the smear negative, but culture positive cases of pulmonary tuberculosis, right? So it has improved the sensitivity in comparison to the previous assay. And here, what are we detecting? We are detecting two genes which are specific to or which are detecting the presence of the mycobacterium tuberculosis, IS6110, as well as IS1081, okay? So this is detecting the organism. Of course, the other thing is still remaining, the RPOP gene mutation, right? So these are the two things by the ultra assay. So remember this one also has been added on. Isotype switching occurs in which of the following cells? Helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, B cells, and activated B cell. Now, isotype switching. What do we mean by isotype? Isotype is the antibody classes, the different IgM, IgG, IgA, IgD, etc. Right? So, isotype switching, also called as class switching, is seen in activated B cells, right? Now, as we all know that the primary immune response is always of IgM class, right? So when B cells get activated, the antibody secreted by them is always IgM, right? But when they receive special signals from the follicular helper T cells in the form of the binding of CD40 and the CD40 ligand on the follicular helper T cell. So that's one requirement, the binding between the two and in the form of specific cytokines. Then the activated B cell, which is already secreting IgM antibody, can switch its class to secrete in case of interleukin-4 being secreted by the helper T cell, it can secrete IgE or IgG antibodies. And in case it is secreting interleukin-5, this is being secreted by the helper T cell, then it can secrete IgA antibody, right? So this is called as class switching. 
which occurs only in an activated B cell, already secreting antibodies against a specific antigen. An immunocompromised patient after renal transplantation develops chronic diarrhea. On staining the stool sample by quinone stain, we are seeing some rounded structures which are 4 to 6 microns in size. Which of the following is true? Right. So this was an image-based question. What are we seeing? Chronic diarrhea, immunocompromised patient, 4 to 6 micron structures. What are we going to arrive at the diagnosis? Cryptosporidiosis. Now let's see the five options. Globally, the most common species amongst them to cause disease is Cryptosporidium parvum. Now this is the wrong statement. Why? Because the most common, rather the cosmopolitan species is Cryptosporidium hominis. Right, Cryptosporidium parvum is primarily reported from Europe. O cyst is infected immediately after coming out of the stool. Yes, this is correct. Auto infection is seen in case of Cryptosporidium because the O cyst that is formed and that that's excreted out by the patient is already containing the sporozoids. Option C says they are obligate intracellular, not so. They do not have the property of internal auto-infection. Even this is incorrect. They have the property of internal auto-infection, right? So internal meaning within the GI tract that is auto-infection occurring. Now see this diagram here showing the life cycle of cryptosporidium. What are the human is ingesting the oocysts which are containing the sporozoids. These sporozoids are going to invade the mucosa of the small intestines and please see where are they developing they are developing slightly you know they, it is described as extracytoplasmic replication extracytoplasmic replication inside the mucosal cells right so here they will initially develop asexual forms which are called as type 1 neurons right these will be released and they will invade fresh mucosal cells after a few cycles, then the sexual forms are formed, which are called as type 2 merons. Then from these type 2 merozoids or merons, the macrogamete and the microgametes will form. They will fuse with each other after they form gametocytes. A zygote will form. And then there are two type of oocysts which are formed. Thin-walled oocysts which cause internal auto-infection. And the thick walled oocysts, which are already containing, notice both of them are, are already sporulated. So they can cause both internal as well as external auto infection, right? So that's the true statement about cryptosporidin. The only correct statement was that these oocysts are already infective to man. All of the following are features of mycoplasma pneumonia except can be cultured on cell-free medium yes though it may be the smallest pathogenic bacterium it may lack a cell wall but it is very well cultivable on cell-free media the medium name is pplo medium on which it forms fried egg colonies or mulberry shaped colonies Amoxiclav is effective. Now, we have to find the wrong statement here. This is definitely the answer. Because we know mycoplasmas are lacking a cell wall, obviously any cell wall acting antibiotic is not going to be effective in their treatment. Bilateral infiltrates can be seen on the X-ray chest. Yes, possible. And antibodies are useful in diagnosis. Yes, we can do some non-specific tests which are called as the heterophile agglutination tests like the cold agglutination tests. And we can detect specific anti-mycoplasma antibodies either by complement fixation or by ELISA or by immunofluorescent assays. Right. So antibodies are useful in diagnosis. Now, also remember what is the disease caused by mycoplasma pneumonia? It is the primary atypical pneumonia. Mycoplasma pneumonia is the most common cause of any atypical pneumonia. 
and what is this pneumonia also called as walking pneumonia so there is a very prolonged gradual onset of the symptoms like low grade fever headache malaise etc and very important thing to remember is what are the extra pulmonary manifestations of mycoplasma infection please remember all of them skin it can present as maculopapular or vesicular rashes or steven johnson syndrome cardiac complications can occur pericarditis myocarditis cns symptoms encephalitis meningitis myelitis radiculopathies musculoskeletal complications like myalgias arthralgias rhabdomyolysis arthritis very rarely even osteomyelitis raynaud's phenomenon is seen renal complications like glomerulonephritis nephrotic syndrome and hematological problems can occur like autoimmune hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia work of vaccine for sars cov2 is done in which of the following bsl1 to 4 are mentioned work for vaccine is done in bsl3 right so please remember that the who guidelines were put forward way back in march only that the non propagative work on coronavirus 2 sars cov2 non propagative diagnostic work should all be done in bsl2 so if you are asked where would you do the nucleic acid amplification tests where would you do the sequencing where would you do the serological tests etc they would be done in the bsl2 labs but propagative work like virus culture work for vaccine isolation neutralization tests etc should be always done in a bsl lab also remember that these are the various categories or the criteria for the bio safety levels now some students have been constantly asking me that's why i put it up in this discussion only what are the criteria for the bio safety levels first criteria is their disease causing ability so bsl1 cause either no disease or very mild disease bsl2 cause severe disease so also here severe or potentially fatal diseases right the next criteria is what is the risk of transmission to the laboratory worker for bsl1 the risk is low for bsl2 it is moderate or medium and for the bsl3 and 4 the risk of transmission to the laboratory worker is high coming to risk of transmission to the community right so here we have a low risk a low risk again a medium risk or a moderate risk and a high risk of transmission to the community in bsl4 treatment yes available yes yes but no treatment is available for bsl4 pathogens right so these are the criteria we take into account while categorizing the bacterium or rather the pathogen or the microorganism now i'm going to give you some examples of the various bio safety level members this is not a complete list but just covering the important points so bsl1 would contain mainly the non pathogenic microorganisms like bacillus subtilis vibrio hrv saccharomyces cerevisiae bsl2 would contain clostridium difficile the borrelias causing lyme disease toxoplasma salmonella methicillin resistant staph aureus vibrio cholerae herpes viruses dengue virus hepatitis a b c viruses hiv and influenza for so for both these the non propagative work 
again like similar to covi 2 non propagative work should all be done in bsl 2 but the propagative work will be done in bsl 3 so virus culture virus neutralization tests etc should be done in bsl 3 other members of bsl 3 mycobacterium tuberculosis bacillus anthracis francisella salmonella typhi comes here not the rest of the salmonellas these come in bsl 2 rickettsia rickettsi west nile fever virus st louis encephalitis the equine encephalitis viruses sars pandemic influenza this is very important to remember pandemic influenza if you're asked avian influenza strains go where they go in bsl3 histoplasma coccidioides leishmania donoviri and in bsl4 we only have viruses ebola premian congo hemorrhagic fever marburg variola virus south american hemorrhagic fevers rift valley fever virus that's the sign of bio hazard or bio safety levels okay also remember that there are if you're ever asked what would you mark on that which category for air transport so when you are transporting patient specimens of covi2 sars cov2 you will categorize the, or you will mark it as biological substance category b so basically category b and in case you are sending viral cultures then they should be marked as category a and it should be written as that they are infectious substances infectious substance affecting humans and you will also write that this is category a right so since covi2 is such an important pathogen nowadays that we sh- i just gave thought to give you this additional info my information okay presence of antibodies against sars coronavirus 2 in blood indicates which of the following presence of antibodies nothing is mentioned whether it is igm or igg nothing acute viral load no antibodies can be present even later when the patient has already resolved risk of reinfection can't say window period during the window period antibodies are not present only the antigen or the uh, pcr is positive and previous infection in an asymptomatic ear patient yeah could be possible yes so this is the answer please i am not sure about the options in this question but by repeated questions a uh, questioning of the students i have been able to arrive at possibly these options so the answer to this is in an asymptomatic in patient we can use it as a um, indicator for infection right now as we all know what is the gold standard method for diagnosis of sars cov2 infection it is rt pcr reverse transcriptase pcr and what is the positivity rates of these rt pcr for bowel fluid it is 93% for sputa specimens it is 72% for nasopharyngeal swabs which are more often used are 63% rather this is the most common specimen that is used and oropharyngeal swabs the positivity is 32% for feces it is 29 and for blood it is 1% right so these are what are easily available and hence most often used okay that's our graph showing us the nats positivity so the blue line is showing us the rna of the virus and the antigen when it becomes positive so this is the point of infection around the point day 5 that's the considered as the incubation period 
So at this time, RT-PCR and antigens may be positive. Antigens can be detected by cell. Now we are coming up with immunochromatographic tests for detecting antigens. Though not widely used, yes, now they've started being available in India. Around the end of the first week after infection, the IgM is becoming positive. It is falling around, somewhere around the third week and around the second week, IgG antibodies appearing, right? And IgG remains in the blood and probably provides lifelong immunity. Hopefully provides lifelong immunity, right? So let's interpret with the help of this table. Uh, just before that, just to detect antibodies, what are the two types of tests which are used? ELISA, but this requires specific um, laboratories, but easy to do tests are the immunochromatographic tests in which we can get the following results. There's a control band to tell us the validity of the test. If only two bands are, uh, depending upon what is the site of the band, it could be IgG. That means it's a remote, remote infection or then patient got infected earlier, probably around two weeks back or maybe before. And IgM is indicative of recent infection. If both of them are positive, that means the patient has been recently infected and even IgG antibodies have appeared, right? We just saw the graph. That's how we interpret the results. Three bands, that means both IgM and IgG are positive. Right, so test results and what is the clinical significance? Let's interpret them. If the PCR is positive, that means I'm talking about RT-PCR and IgM and IgG antibodies have not yet appeared. What does it tell us? It's a window period of infection. If both PCR as well as IgM are positive, that means it's an early infection, right? If all the three are present, RT-PCR, IgM and IgG, it's an active phase of infection. If PCR is positive, and IgG is positive, that means it is probably a late infection, right? So PCR is still remaining positive, but IgM antibodies have disappeared, right? I put the graph along with you so that you can keep on interpreting. If PCR is negative, IgM is positive, IgG is negative, that means it's probably a false negative PCR in an early infection. And if PCR is negative, IgM and IgG antibodies are positive. It is possibly a recovery phase. So PCR has become negative earlier than usual. And lastly, PCR is positive, IgM is positive, but and Ig sorry, PCR and IgM are negative. Only IgG is positive. That means it's a remote infection, recovered past infection. Right, so that's how we interpret the results. All of the following are measures used against COVID-19, except, now this is such a simple question. 70% ethanol, yes. Face mask, hand wash, yes. But we, this is not effective. Why? Because glutaraldehyde or Cydex is effective in a concentration of 2% not 1%, right? And kindly remember that the best concentration of alcohol that is used, if you're asked to choose between which one would you prefer, 60%, 70%, 80%, 70% is the best concentration, most effective in this concentration. False about Wheels disease. So Wheels disease is ectrohemorrhagic fever or severe leptospirosis. It is caused by a spirochete, correct? The organism can be seen directly under the microscope. No, this is the wrong statement. Why? Because leptospira and treponema, both of them are too slender to be seen by the light microscope. It can be cultured on EMGH medium. Yes, EMGH, Gotthoff, Stewart's, Fletcher's medium and it is a zoonotic disease. This is also true. Rodents are the main reservoir, but there are so many other domestic animals like pigs, dogs, etc., which can act as reservoirs. So this is our mode of infection for leptospirosis. Man, rodents are the reservoirs. How do we get infected? 
rodent urine that's where the leptospires are present while swimming in contaminated water exposure of mucous membranes or through wounds on the uh, skin etc exposure of open wounds swallowing or drinking contaminated water or food and splashing of or contaminated water or urine directly into the eyes right so this is how we get infected man is a dead end host that and host false statement about ebola virus it's a filo virus correct vector is mosquito this is the answer this is the incorrect statement about ebola bats are reservoirs and nosocomial transmission is seen yes these two are correct now ebola viruses this is the typical morphology they are filament shaped viruses filo viruses can you see these are the long forms these they sometimes get folded like this right these are called as torus forms filo viruses all of them are enveloped and single stranded rna viruses which is negative stranded right and filo viruses the important members are marburg virus Marburg virus has only one species which is further classified into two genotypes so on the basis of nucleic acid sequencing there are two genotypes these are called as the marburg virus and the ravan virus so these are the two genotypes now coming to ebola virus ebola viruses that's the other member of filo viruses there are six species so what are these species zaher sudan ivory coast bundi bungyo reston and the latest one which has been added is bombali now out of these the zaire causes the most severe disease reston infects but there is no human disease yes it can cause a human infection but there is no disease that it manifests as okay and bombali up till now it has been only isolated from bats not from humans right also remember that the disease due to ebola virus has an incubation period of 2 to 21 days and what is the characteristic features it's a hemorrhagic fever so we are going to have a patient reporting with hemorrhages plus disseminated intravascular coagulation with multi organ failure multi organ failure and mortality rates of ebola hemorrhagic fever range from 40 to 90% right so highest mortality rates are associated with the zaire sub species why is this virus called as ebola because ebola is a river somewhere in congo that's where it was first reported from okay this is the transmission cycle of ebola viruses that's the reservoir fruit bats so they can infect the non human primates and they can also infect man so how does man get infected by close contact with infected animals it could be bats or these non human primates by butchering or eating or or while handling their contaminated organs or cells right and once a human get infected it can get transmitted to 
others that is the healthcare workers the close contacts of the patient or people who come in contact with a dead body during funerals infected needles so their body fluids blood even sexual transmission has been reported right so it can get it is transmitted primarily via body fluids no vectors as was mentioned in this question now i would just like to to bring bring to your notice that this is just today's news today that uh, there was an outbreak of ebola virus which was being ongoing in congo for the last 2 years and it has been declared over by the who today itself which one of the following infections needs special precautions to prevent the disease by airborne route airborne route i have written it in brackets i am not sure what was the question that was asked droplet nuclei was written or the airborne route was written right now droplet nuclei basically means particles generated by coughs sneezes etc which are less than 10 microns in size right 10 microns so they keep on hanging in the air and they become sources of infections but for people who may pass by several hours or minutes later right so which one of the following can be transmitted easily by airborne route that's what we've been asked in this question now this is a, dif a difficult one that i finally went to the cdc side to arrive at the answer and this is a clipping of the same this is the center of disease control site they say that the airborne transmission precautions should be taken by airborne i mean the droplet nuclear transmission should be taken for these following diseases tuberculosis measles chickenpox and disseminated herpes zoster right so tb measles chickenpox and disseminated herpes zoster so that's why our answer is measles for this needle prick in a healthcare worker so there was a history the patient is hbv reactive the anti hbs of the healthcare worker the level is more than 90 milli international units what should be done for hb prophylaxis right sorry the question has gone slightly wrong what should be done for hb prophylaxis the answer to this question is nothing why because this healthcare worker is having a protective teeter of anti hbs this is the table showing us the hbb prophylaxis so it depends upon so the decision depends upon the status of the healthcare worker and the source of the infection so let's assess it when the source is hbs antigen positive as it was in this case then we have an option for source is hbs negative that's a known thing and the source is unavailable or the status of the source is not known now in case of unvaccinated patients what are we going to do if the source is hbs antigen positive we are going to give immunoglobulins plus we are going to initiate the three dose vaccine series in case the hbs antigen the source is hbs antigen negative we will give three dose vaccine series only and in case it is unknown in the third situation we will start the vaccine series if the patient is vaccinated and a known responder as was in this case we do not need to give treatment in any case right coming to vaccinator vaccinated and known non responder when do we say that a patient a person is responder or non responder it depends upon the level of the anti hbs if it is less than 10 milli international units it's said to be non responder if it is more responder right so our patient was a responder he had a deter of more than 90 right so this is you can see the table and such cases when the patient is non responder and the uh, source is hbs antigen positive we are going to give immunoglobulins plus we are going to give a vaccine booster to uh, increase the dose of the anti hbs deter or we may decide to give two doses of 
hepatitis B immunoglobulins. So we are giving preformed antibodies to raise the teeter. No teeter in case of the source being HBS negative as well as the source is unavailable. But if there is a history that this patient could be a high risk. You have, he has, you know, is a, a patient of drug abuse, or you know, he's HIV positive, etc. In such cases, we will treat treat like this, like HBS antigen positive. Finally, if the healthcare worker or the person exposed the anti-HBS response is unknown, we are going to determine the anti-HBS theta and treat accordingly. If it is more than or equal to ten, no treatment required. If it is less than, then we will give immunoglobulins and the vaccine booster. So you can just take a screenshot of this table and learn it. Then we got a clinical question. The exact clinical history is not available. The child had bloody diarrhea. There's a history of bloody diarrhea. And this is followed by joint pain pains two weeks later. What is the likely cause? The likely cause is this is shigellosis, dysentery, along with followed by the complication, reactive arthritis. Right. So answer to this is shigella. So that's why it is so important to know the complications, to have that clinical correlation to arrive at the answers. Now, this is one of the, I mean, the craziest questions someone can ask us. This was a table. This was this has been picked up from a clinical microbiology review on leptospirosis. So this was the time scale week one, two, three, four given on. The incubation period was mentioned two to 20 days. So this, this is week one. We saw that the patient had fever. Right. Then week two, the patient still has fever. There's an asymptomatic stage followed by again fever developing. So it's a biphasic illness. Now, this I'm sure was not mentioned. Leptospires present in probably this had been erased. So possibly they could have must have written something. I don't know the bacteria or organism. It is present in week one in the blood. Also present in CSF. And it is detectable, it is present in the urine in the second week. Now, when you think of urine, you, you tend to think, okay, salmonella typhi is detectable in the patient's urine. But that is in the third, fourth, third to fourth week. So this is here, it is the second week. So now that should give you an idea that this is leptospirosis, right? So the antibodies coming to the antibodies, they are starting to rise in the second week. That is generally seen in any disease. And culture is positive in the blood, the CSF, as well as in the urine. In blood, it is positive primarily in the first week and towards the beginning of the second week. And in urine, it is appearing in the second week. So leptospirosis is our diagnosis. This is a really tough one. Can stump anyone in the exam. Anyway, you would get sight seeing such a table such a graphic representation okay nodular swelling over the lymphatics well, this was again an image based question what is the likely cause of course this is such a commonly asked question nodulo ulcerative lesions along lymphatics the answer to this is sporotrichosis right now similar appearance kindly remember this is sometimes asked that is similar lesions these are called as sporotrichoid lesions or nodular lymphangitis is seen in the other infections like swimming pool granuloma. Swimming pool granuloma. Then cutaneous nocardiosis. Then we sometimes it is seen in cutaneous leishmaniasis. Then tularemia. And staphylococcal botryomycosis. Right? 
right? So similar lesions can be seen in all these. If the numerical aperture of the objective lens of the light microscope is increased, which of the following will happen? The contrast increases, the magnification increases, the resolution increases, and the height from where the work can be done increases. The answer to this question is magnification increases. I am not very good at physics, but I will try to justify my answer. Of course, the answer is this only. Now, numerical aperture of the objective lens has a formula by which we can calculate it. Numerical aperture is n sine alpha. n is the refractive index of the medium between the stage and the objective lens, right? So n sine alpha and what is alpha or sometimes sine mu? It is one half of the angular aperture of the objective. What is the angular object uh, aperture? This is the angular aper aperture. The angle formed between the object and the objective lens, right? Now notice, as we all know, we have the low dry objective lens, the high dry objective lens, and the oil immersion lens. Isn't that so? When we are using the low dry objective lens, we know it is far high. The objective lens is very far from the stage. When we lower it down, then we are using the high dry objective lens. And further, almost, almost onto the stage, that time we are using the oil immersion lens, right? Now, the refractive index of air in the case of high dry objective and low dry objective lens, we are not using any oil over the stage, over the slide. So the refractive index of air is taken as one. When we are using oil, that time the refractive index between the objective lens and the stage is 1.5, right? So that is why we are putting the uh, oil in between so that the numerical aperture increases and the magnification also increases, right? So and when we are close, when we are using the oil immersion lens, we can achieving we are achieving thousand times magnification with a low dry objective lens. We are using uh, achieving just 100 times magnification, right? So the here the numerical aperture is less because the refractive index of air is one and the angle angular object, uh, aperture is also less. Now coming to this situation, notice here, now the angle of aperture, so half, one half of this is theta or alpha. Right. So the theta or alpha value is increasing here, plus the refractive index is also increasing. It is 1.5. You put oil. So obviously now the numerical aperture is going to increase. Numerical aperture increases, magnification increases. Right. Sorry, if I have not been able to do justice to the explanation, I am very bad at physics. Which of the following is the enzyme conjugate, right? This is, the, these, this diagram was shown and the options A, this was the A, the B, the C and the D, right? So the enzyme, so basically this is a variety of a very sensitive type of sandwich ELISA. Highly sensitive type. So we've sandwiched the antigens between a capture antibody, a detector antibody. Then there is another secondary. This is a secondary antibody. This is another enzyme linked antibody, which is the detector antibody. So this is primary antibody. This is secondary antibody directed towards this antigen. And uh, this is the detector antibody, which is conjugated with the enzyme. Right, so this is where the enzyme is present. What are the commonly used enzymes in ELISAs? Horseradish peroxidase, alkaline phosphatase, right? These, when they are present, they will bring about a color change in the substrate. So the answer to this is P. I'm taking up a couple of PGI questions since I've acquired them, might as well just finish them here. 
Leptospirosis, which of the following are true? It is seen in rice field farmers, workers. Yes, true. It's a zoonotic infection, not transmitted by mosquitoes. The causative organism is not a virus. Human to human transmission is never seen, right? A man is a dead end host. So the only A and B are correct. Louis Pasteur, which of the following statements are true? He did not discover. This was Robert Koch who discovered the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. He discovered the rabies vaccine. He propounded the germ theory. He discovered the causative organism of anthrax and discovered pasteurization. SLE-like disease is seen in deficiency of which of the following? C1, C2 and C4. Fluconazole can be used for which of the following? It is used for cryptococcus. Both Candida glabrata and cruzii are resistant to fluconazole. Mucormycosis, they are resistant. That, that is why we treat them with amphotericin B. And Candida albicans can be treated with fluconazole. So this brings us to the end of our discussion. Now, before I wind off my session, I would like to give you the important points about rather important topics in microbiology that must always be covered for getting at least 80% of your questions correct in your exams, right? So I'm going to broadly divide them, take them up topic wise. When we talk about uh, our first tip topic, that is sterilization and disinfection. This is a very important topic. Next, we move on to bacteriology. Now, in bacteriology, please make sure you study the general bacteriology topic. Then coming to the important bacteria. Mycobacterium, spirochetes, so all the three spirochetes very important, then Rickettsiaceae family and by Rickettsiaceae I include Bartonella etc. So and related genera I would like to write. Then Staphylococcus, especially MRSA. How do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? How do you eliminate staph? Then Streptococcus. Right? So these are the important bacteria. Very, very important. Right? But this does not mean you cannot get questions on mycoplasmas or brucella or bordetella or campylobacter. Occasionally, yes, one, a couple of questions might be from outside these, but these are definitely almost always asked. Right? Even Vibrio is important. Right. Moving on to our next viruses. Now, in viruses, very, very important th thing to remember, I have even said it in my videos, that general virology is very important, meaning the properties of the various viruses, families, the members of the families, very important, right? So whether it is enveloped, negative stranded genome, whether it is a DNA, where does it replicate, etc. Next, coming to the viruses, hepatitis B, HIV, all herpes viruses, very important. These three, very, very important. Then next is myxoviruses, measles, mumps, influenza. Then we have our important member, papilloma viruses. Then rubella is very important, right? Then whatever is the recent outbreaks, please remember about them. 
whatever recent is going on like we have sometimes we had nipa sometimes we have ebola going on that's why they are more often asked or covid is going on so these are often asked then coming to parasites in parasites let's talk about protozoa first entamoeba giardia leishmania toxoplasma and plasmodium very important even babesia is very often asked right don't say i have written all of them please what to do coming to helminths amongst helminths tinea echinococcus strongyloides escaris then the hookworms then cutaneous larva migrants and visceral larva migrants and the schistosomes i just like to mention there was a question in this aims exam i did not take up that question there was a lung fair so it was a, a picture of a lung a lung no liver and there was lot of fibrosis shown in that liver what was the likely cause what could be the likely cause of this fibrotic liver i think there was a clinical history i'm not sure so the answer to that question was schistosoma either japonicum or mansonia was mentioned amongst the options like so when they becomes a chronic disease leads to portal hypertension and that can lead to uh, rather the fibrosis of the liver leads to portal hypertension right so these are the important helminths lastly we are left with the fungi of course we have immunity also so fungi the important is candida cryptococcus mucormycosis pneumocystis then please uh, the histoplasma is important histoplasmosis and dermatophytes again i am reiterating this does not mean that people questions can't be asked from outside these topics coming to immunology antibodies complement mhc the important properties of the b cells and the t cells their markers isotype switching affinity maturation and uh, what are we left with hypersensitivity reactions right these are the important points right now coming to our my final advice as to how to study microbiology please don't consider it as as a useless subject this is a blunder made by many students they consider microbiology pharmacology not important and when they come to attempt the paper they find oh god the whole paper is full of microbes microbes crawling over there what is the treatment of this infectious disease what is the treatment of this infectious disease what is the profile axis of this disease and then you are stumped and you come out cursing the microbiologist cursing the pharmacologist please don't make this mistake give importance to these subjects they may be paraclinical subjects but they are all you know mixed with each other nowadays it doesn't you don't know whether it's a medicine question a pediatrics question a psm question or a microbiology question so kindly study microbiology well give due importance let's start to love the microbes okay coming to my advice to you if you have by this time this is beginning of 
uh, almost July now. By this time, if you have covered at least eight, nine subjects or 10 subjects of your revision and you're still left with microbiology, that means you have adequate time till August to cover the rest of the topics. So I would advise you to give microbiology nine to 10 days. This is if you are way, we have moved ahead in your revision, maybe eight, ten, nine to 10 subjects you've already done, right? But if you are starting out, you've just started out in June and you have to take the exam in the next six, seven months, in that case, you have to reduce your time for microbiology to six days, right? Now, coming to how are you going to divide your time for dividing I would advise that you devote about 40% of your time to bacteriology, 20% of your time to viruses, and the rest of the time, so we are left with 40%, divided 15% for immuno, 15% for parasito, and finally, 10% for mycology, fungi, right? This is how you're going to divide your time. Now you decide whether you're going to spend 10% uh, 10 hours in a day or eight hours in your day for studying the whole day, divide it accordingly, right? So this is how I would advise. This is when you're studying it, microbiology as a complete subject in those nine to 10 days or six days. But if you're combining it as a smaller subject, then of course you have to increase the time accordingly, right? Give three plus three or four days for that smaller subject and three days for that smaller subject into these six days, right? For any further queries, you can of course directly ask me on my telegram group or on my facebook group or directly on or in maru links